Hey there, my name is Alex. This fundamentally is a video about data. More specifically, it's a video about data scraping and the sorts of feedback loops that can occur sometimes when using scraped data over long periods of time. It's also a video about Magic the Gathering, although hopefully I've made it somewhat accessible to people who haven't made the terrible mistake of playing this game. Magic the Gathering was released in 1993, and followed the template of a lot of card games. There was an opponent to defeat, and defeating them requires some little dudes that do things, as well as other types of cards. It's a game whose play formats are mostly designed for two players, which always brings up the natural question of, well, what do my other 1-4 to four friends do? Just stand there looking sad on this flooded strand? I certainly remember being 12 and sitting on the floor with five other kids, playing a game that gets abandoned after 90 minutes, but that's not ideal. Enter Elder Dragon Highlander, known more commonly now simply as EDH or Commander. EDH is a format with four players, where each person picks one of their little guys to be a commander that they can play multiple times at escalating cost. With Origins in Alaska in the late 1990s, the format gradually gained popularity over time, with Wizards of the Coast finally printing a set specifically for the format in 2011. This set was more of a toolbox than anything else. The pre-built decks were technically playable, but not very good, containing a mishmash of themes and random unrelated cards. They were seemingly intended to be hammered out with other cards into a more functional deck. This is probably a good thing, as it gave newer players a gentle push toward building their own deck. Building a deck is one of the most fundamental processes in any collectible card game, but people don't often think about the intricacies of how decks actually get built. It usually starts with formulating basic ideas and a bunch of rummaging. Whoa! Plummet and Spontaneous Flight? That's a wombo combo! By rummaging, I hear me looking through cards. This can be looking through physical cards in a collection, or looking through card galleries, or even performing searches with websites like Gatherer. With these various methods of rummaging, you're going to be asking questions like, Is this card good? Does it fit into my deck? How many cards of this type should I be running? How will this card work against the people I'm likely to play against? Does this card fit the aesthetic of my deck where all the facial expressions in the art are funny? Yes. Yes, it does. Different players will be asking different questions, but every player uses some criteria or other. Another major piece of deck building is looking at other people's decks either physically or through websites where people post their decks. This could be the last step in deck building to find cards you might have missed, the first step where you're trying to get a bit of inspiration, or somewhere in the middle where you're trying to hammer out the structure of the deck. Now, this is all well and good, but let's try out a little thought experiment and say that we're trying to use the power of technology to simplify deck building. A lot of the rummaging, either digital or physical, is hard to directly replace. But the act of looking at other people's decks theoretically could be. Looking at individual decks is relatively slow, since each individual deck has the biases of its deck builder, meaning that unless you really trust the deck builder, it's a good idea to look at multiple different decks. What if we could look at all similar decks at the same time, seeing cards based on how often other people choose to run them. This is where EDH rec comes in for the commander format. In theory, a website that aggregates deck lists is going to allow sorting through a ton of potential card choices very efficiently. We aren't trusting the card analysis of just a single person, but rather the analysis of the collective, thereby reducing the risk of bias. Now, something to watch out for would be if these decks are influenced by each other, which could compound bad card decisions by people. This effect will probably always exist to some extent, since people look at each other's deck lists 
and generally exist in the same ecosystem, but by default it likely isn't going to be pronounced enough to undermine the idea behind an aggregating website. The fact that people aren't perfect analysts of cards and sometimes trust other people's imperfect analyses isn't a particularly devastating critique. Rather, it's more along the lines of saying that we live in a society. Everything I just said applies to EDHREC as it existed at its launch in 2015. As a website, EDHREC scrapes deck lists from websites such as Architect and MTG Goldfish, where players post their deck lists to receive feedback. These deck lists are then organized by commander, as well as by other categories, like price and sub-themes. And then within each tab, cards are displayed by the frequency with which they appear in decks. If I'm trying to build an Arcades the Strategist deck, I don't have to scroll down far to find Overgrown Battlements, a card that is found in 95% of the Arcades decks that EDHREC has scraped. Nice, that seems good. I should put that in my deck. Ah, Shieldwall Sentinel? That goes in too. Wow, I've got all these great cards for my Defender deck, and I didn't need to put in very much effort to find them. Time to log into my favorite website and post this deck so I can send it to all my friends. It's at this point that EDHREC goes, Wow, a new deck was posted? Time to add this useful data to my Arcades the Strategist page so that other players can benefit from this original card analysis. You might be able to see the problem here. In this case, instead of getting data from independently operated deck builders, EDHREC is receiving a regurgitation of its own aggregated data plus maybe a bit of the deck builder's discretion on which specific cards to add. A little bit of this type of deck doesn't really change EDHREC's methodology, but since all posted decks are treated equally, and decks made heavily using EDHREC are much quicker and easier to build than decks built from the ground up, the proportion of decks built mainly with EDHREC naturally balloons over time. As this proportion increases, we get two compounding effects. For one, cards that didn't quite make it into the EDHREC listings, or which are lower on the page, get artificially tanked further. This in turn makes the EDHREC card suggestions artificially sluggish to changes in how decks are played and which decks are played, since for every time a player thoughtfully puts a less played card in their deck, there's another player building a deck straight off the EDHREC page that doesn't include that card because they weren't presented with it. Secondly, the cards already high up in the EDHREC recommendations are bolstered, regardless of how useful they actually are. The cards at the very top are generally good, but there are a lot of cards that get played in 10-50% to 50 of decks that are... peculiar. When I think of the archetypal overplayed card in the format, it's one that is questionable on its own, but is good in a game where the deck's commander sticks on the battlefield, untouched by other players at the table. You could also call this a win-more card. A card that's bad when a player is behind, or when a game is tight, but strong when a player is already ahead. Commanders are the flashiest and most visible part of commander decks, so even without something like EDH rack, players tend to overrate cards that are better when the commander sticks to the board. EDHREC compounds this, as these questionable synergy cards are pushed high up in the results and tell players that they're played in 40% of decks, thereby amplifying the deck-building mistakes of EDH players. As an example of this, a friend of mine was building a Volo Guide to Monsters deck recently. Let's call him Bartholomew. Bartholomew sent me the list, asking for suggestions, and it had several of these win-more cards, with the two that caught my eye being Second Harvest and Junkwinder. These cards aren't bad, necessarily, but he was building a deck with a number of powerful format staples, like Ristic Studies and Consecrated Sphinx. And by comparison, these win-more cards are really only good when Volo sticks around for multiple turns in a row. And if you're that far ahead, that that's the case, there are much stronger things that you're probably able to do. I told Bartholomew that he should cut these cards 
and silently wondered to myself why he'd added them. When I went to the EDH rec page for Volo out of curiosity a bit later, I got my answer. The website is here to quickly inform me that 48% of Volo decks run Junkwinder, and 47% run Second Harvest. Proportions high enough to make even an experienced player think twice about calling them bad cards. This also speaks to a broader issue with giving high-powered deck building tools to inexperienced players. EDH Rack can tell people what cards are being played, but it can't tell them why or what they contribute towards a well-rounded deck. There are some pieces of a deck that are clear as to why they run. I want to run Axebane Guardian because my commander Arcadius the Strategist encourages me to have lots of defenders, and I run Slaughter the Strong because most of my creatures have zero power. However, there are other cards that aren't as obvious. Why run Path to Exile or Negate? They don't relate to my commander in any direct way. They just interact with my opponent. A lot of players don't understand why these cards are good, and I'd speculate that this results in these players adding only a handful of these cards, and adding them out of a sense of obligation, rather than any clear vision. This results in a casual EDH format, where most of the decks are stuffed with win more, only good with the commander cards. With these cards taking up space, they could have been occupied with cards that are better in the deck, but whose purpose is less immediately obvious. A general trend I've noticed is that most casual EDH decks don't run nearly enough of two key things, pressure and removal. Pressure, essentially, is just things that make your opponent's life totals go down, usually creatures that can attack them. If you know your opponent is playing a deck stuffed with win more cards, one that will do nothing and have no defenses until it later snowballs out of control, a natural response should be to turn your creatures sideways and punish that deck before they randomly pop off. Removal is similar. If you know your opponent is running a deck loaded up with cards that do nothing when their commander doesn't stick around, then all you have to do to keep that player in check is make sure a Doomblade gets tossed at their commander whenever it's played, and that's a small price to pay to basically shut down a player. So what does it mean that people don't run enough pressure and removal? It means that the sorts of decks that are stuffed with win more cards go unpunished, and large sections of the casual commander format become akin to multiplayer solitaire, with each player racing toward their own win plan, and just praying that they can outrun their opponent. I don't love this fact, and this is where some people might say, but Alex, EDH is a fun casual format to play with your friends. This is true, and honestly, if doing wacky hijinks with your commander and playing against other people doing the same is something you enjoy, I'm not here to tell you you're doing anything wrong. I'm also not telling you you're doing anything wrong if you use EDH rec to help you build your decks. I use it pretty regularly when building commander decks, typically in the later stages of decks, where I'm looking for cards I might have missed in my earlier stages. It's a good resource, as long as you treat the cards that it shows you with the same criticality as cards you find anywhere else, and also recognize that there are cards it's not showing you. If there's any message I want people to take away from all this, it's just that EDHREC isn't a magical website. It's a website with all the advantages and all the flaws of anything in our modern age that exists through the wonders of sifting through data slurry, and that fact should inform the way we use it.